Hello, uh, this is Violet Haldane of Advocacy to Legacy, and we are continuing our Understanding How Government Works education series. Um, today we have with us Connecticut State Representative Brandon McGee as our guest to talk about the state rep and its functions, and we have Chris Ann Folks as our youth facilitator. So I am going to turn it over to Chris Ann. Hello, um, my name is Chris Ann Folks, and I'm a student at Southfield High School. And I just wanna kick it off with an introduction by asking you, um, where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Perfect, well, first and foremost, thank you, Chris Ann uh, and Ms. Haldane for this opportunity to be a part of your series. Um, I got involved by organizing on a very local level and identifying mentors who could help me uh, to get to where I am today. Uh, so everybody's journey is not the same, uh, but you're never too young to start. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, so how does being, how does the election for becoming a state representative works? The traditional process is you would, um, first of all, identify as uh, identify with a party, if that's your choosing. So whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or an independent. And from there, you provide the leadership within whatever party you identify with. I identify with the Democratic Party. Uh, you submit your letter of interest. And usually you reach out to your town committee members, which is a group of elected individuals who... Um, basically serve as leaders of, of certain sections of, of the city, whether it's the city of Hartford or any other town. Uh, and you express your interest. Obviously, you need to be a registered voter, okay? Uh, and, and have a passion about something and you run on an issue. Uh, it's just that easy. Um, ideally, you want to be endorsed by your party, which means the group of people say, we want Chris Ann to be our state representative and we will support her and people rally around you. You run. Uh, and if there's another person running against you within that particular party, you have what we call a primary where both your names are on the ballot. May the best person wins. Whoever wins then moves on to the general election. Uh, but it's important to note a couple things. Just be elected have some sort of an issue or passion that you can run on uh, and be sure to reach out to the right folks within, within the party. Okay, thank you. So I know that as a state representative, you, uh, I'm not sure, but you don't represent the entire state. You, you represent um, specific areas. So what areas are you representing right now? So for, for me, and that's a great clarifying question, because uh, oftentimes when people um, think of a state representative, they take that word state <laughs> and they're like, yeah, you represent all of us. Um, so sure, we do work, we, we do vote on policies that impact just about every single resident in the state of Connecticut. But to your direct question, I represent the northeast section of the city of Hartford in the southern part of the town of Windsor. 60% um, of my district is located in the town of Windsor. Obviously, 40% 40 um, 40 is in the city of, of Hartford. Um, and I represent somewhere, give or take, maybe about 20,000 people, 30,000 maybe. Um, uh, between the two towns. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much, um, where, you know, who I represent. Uh, however, um, the longer you are in the state legislature, you, you're able to attain certain positions. Uh, so for example, I am now chair of the housing committee, uh, and I serve on two additional committees, education, um, and human services. And, Oftentimes, you receive, you receive requests and questions from folks throughout the entire state. Uh, and 
I don't mind providing the support or at least providing the name of that representative who represent that particular constituent. So there are ways that you can handle it. But to your question, we represent a very certain district um, as state representatives. Okay, thank you. So uh, being that you do represent um, this um, 40% of the city of Hartford and 60% in the town of Windsor, do you play the same role? Like, do you have the same responsibilities in both areas? What are your, what role do you play? What are your responsibilities? Your responsibility or my responsibility is the same. Uh, that's representing all people um, in the fifth assembly district. Um, however, the requests are different. The challenges um, are different. Um, the engagement is different. Um, and so you respond accordingly. Um, I always tell people in this role, you've got to be extremely nimble. You got to be an innovative. You, you must be, um, you must always be in constant communication and letting people know who you are and what you're doing and how you can be of help uh, to your constituents. Uh, not every community is the same. Uh, so you, you, you have to really customize your advocacy, your communication um, accordingly. And usually, not usually, most times, you know, all politics, if you don't remember anything else that I tell you, all politics is local. So that means I don't care if I serve on the state level, you got to work alongside people where they are. Uh, and again, the issues are different between Hartford and Windsor. Uh, but one thing that they both have in common is that they want vibrant uh, and healthy communities. Okay, thank you. You just used the term that all politics is local. What exactly does that term mean to you? <sighs> I'm so glad that you asked that. Um, all politics is local. Uh, it, it's so local that I ran for mayor. Um, and I don't know if you're aware of that, but I ran for mayor last year uh, because um, I know the importance and the power that lies in local um, politics, uh, local efforts. Me, um, what I mean by all politics being local, everything starts ground level up. You tend to talk about grassroots, and we always talk about the importance of grassroots. Think about it. Everything starts on the surface level, and then you go up, not top down. And so um, to give you some examples, it's important that we serve on our board, boards of educations. And it's important that we tend, attend a lot of our community meetings and we go to our children's PTO or we go to a city council or a town council meeting because every single thing that impacts local residents, a lot of it is derived from local politics. And so for me, it's just so important that our people especially in the 5th Assembly District, understand the importance of being um, present and being um, a part of the conversation on the local level with respect to education, housing, health, uh, you name it. And, and also be in constant communication with your state leadership so that the policies that drive some of the local politics, they work in tandem. Uh, so... That's what I mean by all politics being local and what you're doing, Chris Ann, is, is, is important. You're engaging with your state leadership and asking those questions so that people, you know, we don't assume that everybody understands, you know, what a Brandon McGee is doing. Uh, because quite often people really don't know what state representatives do. Uh, and, and sometimes we get those lines um, uh, sort of mixed up with our city council, our board of education people, local board of education people, while we are to work together, there are some very, um, very distinct re responsibilities. Okay, thank you. Um, being a state representative, do you have a term limit? Like, do you have to run again? Like, how does that work? Yeah, yeah. So you're uh, being a state representative and a state senator, for that matter, um, we serve two year terms. Um, and that said, we're elected every two years. 
Uh, it feels like we're running a campaign every year. <laughs> um, but um, it is uh, very rewarding. Not everyone has this opportunity to serve on a state level and to represent so many people. Um, and I'm just, I'm really fortunate. I am really fortunate to be in this position uh, representing so many great, uh, amazing people. Uh, so yeah, two-year term. It's a part-time legislature, a part-time job, okay? So representatives um, start off by making a $25,000 salary uh, with great health benefits. Um, but meanwhile, we've got to work a full-time job to take care of our families. Um, so, you know, it becomes difficult sometimes when you have to explain to your full-time employer that you got to go over to the state capitol to represent your constituents and vote on policies. Uh, and some people don't realize, you know, that it's a part-time legislature uh, with full-time hours. <laughs> and, and the cars we drive are our cars, not the state uh, of Connecticut. Some people think, you know, yeah, they, they have cars and the state bought their cars. No, that's not true. Everything's part-time. And um, yes, we signed up for the job, but it's important for people to know that Connecticut uh, is one of the few states who, probably one of many, um, that we work on a part-time schedule. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, how do you like your job? Um, if I could be honest with you, I absolutely love, love this opportunity to serve uh, as a state rep. Like I said before, m very few people have this opportunity um, to serve, um, not because they're not qualified, not because, you know, they're not a perfect person. It's, it's just the reality of the situation. Similar to not everybody will be the president of the United States, right? Um, but there are some days it becomes so overwhelming. Um, I come from a generation, uh, and I think uh, Miss uh, Helding, she probably would agree. You know, I give an idea and I love to see it happen and it become a reality the next day. Uh, but that's farthest from the truth when you work in the state legislature. Um, prime example, I've been working on a particular project since I was elected in 2013. Uh, and it just takes a long time of organizing and constantly communicating and reorganizing and communicating and lobbying and advocating, you know, for, for the issues of, of, of the people that you represent. And sometimes that could be daunting. It could be discouraging. It could be um, extremely discouraging. Um, but on the same token, uh, again, it's an opportunity to fight really hard on issues that you believe in. So I love it. But if I can tell the truth, some days I'm just like scratching my head like, now, why did I sign up for this again? Um, but it, again, it, it is, um, it, it's definitely rewarding. Okay. Um, since it is a part-time job, um, is it like 12 months or only a few months out of the year? Like, do you have like specific days where you know you're going to go in or do you just get random calls or how does it work? Nope. That's a great question. Um, usually on a long session, meaning we will be debating the state's budget. Um, we're in for about six months. Uh, so from January, January, February, March, April, May, June, maybe to the mid, mid June, maybe mid-June at the latest beginning of July if we just have some unfinished business. That's a long session. During a short session, we usually run till about May. Uh, and then that concludes our, our legislative session and then we go on break. But meanwhile, a lot of us, more than 90% more than of us are still working. We're working on issues, we're gearing up for the next legislative session. Um, so you do a lot of constituency work uh, during your off time, meaning you're back in district and, and you're engaging with a lot of the stakeholders there. Um, but, but yeah, so six months, uh, uh, long session, and then four months for the shorter session. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anything that I didn't ask that you think we should know about your job? 
wanted to make sure that, um, you know, your viewers and other uh, activists, young activists know the importance of our role, uh, but, but, but also know that you're never too young to do the work that you're doing. Uh, and, and even during this time, this is definitely a movement. Um, this is a movement. There were young people during the 60s who were in the same seat that you're in right now. Uh, and I'm going to push you, Chris, to, to do more and to be more vocal uh, and to also share your voice uh, and weigh in on some of these issues that you feel like, ah, I'm, young, I'm too young. I, I can't really speak to it. Uh, and that's farthest from the truth. Um, all movements actually started with young people. And if you don't believe me, do your homework and we can have another conversation. Uh, but it starts with you. And just know that uh, from my office, um, as the state representative of the 5th Assembly District, I'm here to support whatever it is you and the, the other young people uh, commit to. And, and thanks for this opportunity. Okay, thank you. I have a few more questions. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, earlier, um, you mentioned that you are a chairman on, on multiple committees. And I'm just curious as to um, what role do you play on all those committees, the housing community, committee, the education committee, and um, the house service? Human, human services. So I am the chairman of the housing committee. So I chair, I'm responsible for the, the agenda for that particular committee, getting bills passed through the committee, and then I debate those bills on the floor of the House of Representatives. Um, on the human services committee, I'm just a member. Um, and... I can weigh in on issues. I can submit um, policy recommendations uh, and I could lobby for, you know, whatever the concerns might be from my district. Uh, and then the education committee, likewise, I am also just a committee member um, and I can weigh in on issues. I can lobby, I can push back. Um, but those are the three committees that, that I serve on. Okay. Um, on the housing committee, um, what what kind of things do you guys do there? What what responsibilities do you guys have there? What roles do you play? Do you guys what rules do you make? If, um, there are a lot of rules already on the books, uh, but our responsibility as uh, the committee that has cognizance over housing matters. Um, we're responsible uh, for passing policy that support equity and housing. Um, and we work um, in partnership with our Department of Housing, uh, the State Department of Housing. Uh, we are not a housing authority. We, you know, we don't, we don't take up, you know, um, landlord issues um, directly. However, we, we could serve as a liaison for example, if I had, you know, a constituent with a housing issue, I can pick up the phone and call our commissioner who will then say, hey, I recommend that you do X, Y, and Z. Or I can pick up the phone and call the executive director of the Hartford Housing Authority uh, and other housing authorities to, to, to figure out, you know, a question that a constituent might have. Um, but I can also uh, pass policy that support people on the local level, right? So we have slum landlords. We have people who are um, just not great landlords. We have housing issues. Um, we have lack of investment in certain neighborhoods. Uh, there are policies that I can put in place to help support um, all of those areas that I've just identified. Uh, so hopefully that, that answer, answers your question. Okay, I have another question. Did the housing committee make any um, safety policy or any rules um, regarding COVID-19? I'm not sure if I'm following your question because just to educate you um, and, and your viewers, once we went into the pandemic and we went into quarantine, uh, legislative session was over in March right? Meaning we didn't pass any bills. We didn't do anything. All of the executive power went to the governor, Governor Ned Lamont, who then 
uh, since March have enacted executive orders that would support many of the challenges that folks are faced with that would normally be addressed by policies that we would have passed if we were in a regular legislative session. For example, in housing, we pushed for all evictions to be, um, to place a moratorium, meaning essentially there is no landlord that can evict a tenant, okay, because of lack of payment. We know that people lost their jobs. We know that just people did not have the financial resources to pay their rent. So we got a moratorium placed on evictions. Um, we also shut down the court system. We also made sure through the Department of Labor, through the federal government, that people were receiving their um, uh, uh, unemployment checks weekly, right? So there were a lot of measures that we helped to influence the governor to then call an executive order to say, okay, we want to make sure we protect housing, restaurants, school children, et cetera. Uh, so while there were a lot of housing policy measures that passed our committee uh, prior to going, you know, on quarantine and all that good stuff, um, we, we didn't do much business uh, this year uh, in, in the 2020 legislative um, session. Okay, thank you. Um, you said that you represent about 20,000 people. Um, so how, how can they contact you? Um, they can contact me via email. Um, that's brandon.mcgee at cga.ct.gov. Uh, they can call the office. Um, I don't have that number on me. <laughs> I can get it to you. Um, or we can use um, Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or snail mail, write a letter. Um, so there are many, many forms of, of or modes of communication where people could reach out to me. Um, and uh, we can also schedule one of these Zoom calls. Um, you know, we're still in COVID. Uh, and the reality is people are still getting sick and some people are dying. Uh, so I want to respect that. Um, but, but yeah, so that's how you can get in touch with me. And I'm sure you all can find, you can just Google the number and, and put it up here so that people could have it once they view this. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you. This completed thank all you. my questions. Have a good one. Thank you, you. we appreciate everything. Have a good Bye -bye. one. Take care.